bit of history, exactly what Tony mentioned, um, our very first uh, participation in Living Machines. I use this sometimes as a screensaver because uh, StickyBot and StickyBot2 are probably the best known alumni from my laboratory. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of what's behind uh, bio-inspired robot design. And I'll finish up with some very new work. We have, we have some nice new results that I'd like to share with everybody. I guess before I launch in in too much detail, um, can everybody see the screen? And are, are you able to hear me? Is it all good? All good, I think. I got a thumbs up. OK. All right. So um, for a number of our robotics projects, we've worked with uh, Professor Bob Fold from across the bay. And Bob is a biologist. And when you, and over repeated projects, especially when you ask Bob, you ask, well, what, what lessons does biology have for bio-inspired design? And one of the first is, is this idea of uh, reducing complexity. Anything that you look at in biology, whether you go down to a, a part of an organism or even a single cell, or my goodness, even protein folding, is just outrageously complicated. And so your reaction as a roboticist, as an engineer is, well, we can't do that. Well, and you're right, you can't do that. Fortunately, nature also has some very good lessons about how to simplify things. And you can um, take advantage of those and uh, reduce the uh, dimensionality. We also see animals are very effective at managing energy, at managing their interactions with the environment. Roger in the previous talk actually uh, pointed some of that out. And the two that I'm really gonna focus on here is uh, one, this idea of using multifunctional materials, which um, are responsible for a lot of the robustness we see and uh, uh, exploiting interaction with the environment, not just tolerating what the environment throws at you, but exploiting it. So, uh, one of my favorite slides, this is adapted from a paper by uh, Bob Full and Dad Kodachek. And the point I want to make here is that, um, sure, there is all kinds of sensing and there is a very complex neural system. But what this wraps around is an inner mechanical system, a passive system, what the biologists call preflexes, zeroth order response, which can inherently be stabilizing. And this is really very different from the way we tend to build things in robotics, where we have a more modular approach. We have our actuators, we have our sensors, we have our passive mechanical structure. But here, as you can see, it's all rather tightly integrated. When we try to build these systems, we use uh, multi-material manufacturing processes, we have to. StickyBot itself was made using an older multi-material process called shape deposition manufacturing. Uh, the way this process works is that you deposit part material and then you shape it, you actually remove material. And we like material removal because it gives us a very uh, smooth surface finish. Then you can embed discrete components. We add a layer of sacrificial support material. We shape that too and then the cycle continues. Uh, if you, in fact, I think it would have been very difficult to build StickyBot without access to this manufacturing cycle. It lets us build soft and hard materials into a single structure with embedded components. Nowadays, I have to say, we are using shape deposition manufacturing less and less. Uh, 3D printers have become much better than they were even 10 years ago, and the ability to 3D print hard and soft materials in a single structure is much better than it used to be. So we, it, now I have to say SDM is kind of our process of last resort, which we use when, when we really need that very smooth surface finish. One place we do need it is the legs of walking robots because they undergo millions of cycles and we don't want fatigue failure. This slide actually um, has a nice tie with some of the issues that Roger was talking about. Uh, on the left, we have an isolated uh, tropical cockroach leg. And of course, that's one of the nice things about cockroaches is that you can do that. Uh, you keep it hydrated and then you can apply forces to it, stimuli, and, and see how it responds for a while. And on the right is our uh, robotic, at, at this time, it was a, a hexapetal robot leg. It doesn't look anything like the cockroach leg, but uh, it has a similar behavior. 
and it also leads to a very stable locomotion. And in this picture on the right, the clear material is a hard urethane. The pinkish material is a, a soft uh, viscoelastic polymer. And one of the interesting things, and again, this uh, is a nice uh, follow-on from Roger's talk, that you see when you uh, actuate the um, insect leg is that it actually has a lot of damping. This is a plot of force on the vertical axis and displacement on the horizontal axis. And you can see that it's a quite hysteretic cycle. So quite a bit of energy is being dissipated. And this is uh, helps to stabilize the cockroach. So we intentionally chose a quite viscoelastic polymer for our robots. And in fact, we can also prove that it improves the stability of the robot when running at uh, different frequencies over rough terrain. All right, let me move on now to the main point, which is I'm going to talk about, about uh, adhesion and some of the lessons learned and uh, bioinspiration. And when finally, when we think we really understand what's going on, we may want to depart from, from the bio-inspired solution. So here is a slide from Keller Autumn, for my money, still maybe the number one expert on geckos in the world at Lewis and Clark uh, College. And the point of this slide is that it's a remarkable hierarchy of features. It's a hierarchical adhesive apparatus. So we have uh, conformal features at the centimeter scale, going down to cetal shafts at the 100 micrometer scale, down to the terminal little features, the spatulae, 200 nanometers. Well, this is a nice example of what I said about complexity. As an engineer, we look at this and we go, oh my goodness, there is no way I can build this. And no, we can't. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, what are the really important principles? And so our bio-inspired design process goes something like this. We are faced with a challenge. We look for interesting examples from the animal or plant world. We talk with biologists and look at the literature, and we uh, make some hypotheses about what we think is really important. And by the way, it's at this point that if there's something in it for the biologists, because if, if we're right about any of those hypotheses, it is much easier to test them on robots than it is on animals. Uh, it's not uncommon for animal data to have just one or two percent of your of your data be useful. I remember years ago I had a student who I was co-advising with Bob Full. He would spend three days a week at Stanford and they'd go across the bay to Berkeley to spend a couple of days a week in Bob's lab and he'd spent all morning putting little tiny wires into these tropical death's head cockroaches and by around noon He's finally ready to take some data and he puts the cockroach on its little tiny cockroach treadmill and nothing happens. The cockroach is tired or it just doesn't feel like running that day. And this happened all the time, it happened frequently. So, but the robots, if they're working at all, they're, they're more reliable than that. They're, um, anyway, we, we take data, we analyze it. Uh, we use whatever fabrication technology we have to hand. And of course, we never get it exactly right the first time. So there's some refinement of our hypotheses and, and the cycle repeats. And this we've done repeatedly. We did it for running robots. We've done it for climbing robots like StickyBot. We've done it for flying and perching air vehicles. And of course, I've talked, I think, about all of these over the years at Living Machines. All right, I'm going to show very briefly a little clip from the uh, American public television station, PBS Nova, because it does a good job of explaining how the sticky bot features work. This is David Pogue from when he was visiting our lab. The key gecko feature on this- And just let me stop for a sec. Can people hear the video? Are you getting that? Yes. You were getting it. Okay, I'll continue. Robot is the material used for the pads on its feet. They're made from silicone rubber. Tiny wedges on the upper surface of the pad use the same gecko principle of directional adhesion, adhering when dragged down because of the close contact, but the rest of the time not sticky. This is one pad on a little suspension with a weight about 200 grams below. If you just touch it to the surface, it's not sticky at all, but if you let, not at all. let the weight um, hold it, 
Oh man, it sticks perfectly. So and the weight is pulling down. That's the directional thing you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. And then to get it off, you actually have to remove the weight and then it will lift right off. So it's quite firm now, but if I lift it up, oh my gosh, it's like oh, the electricity right was turned off. That's directional. And that's what the real gecko does. And that's what the gecko does. And in fact, uh, if you've ever seen a gecko going head first down a wall, you'll see that it's turned its rear feet back. All right. So there's the basic idea. OK, well, what, what are, you know, hypotheses? What is important? We knew from the outset that conforming to surfaces at multiple length scales was going to be important. So that's part of why Sticky Bot has these under actuated toes that comply at the centimeter scale, and then we've got other features that, that conform at a smaller scale on the surface of the toes. What we probably didn't understand when we started the project is how important this directional adhesion is. Uh, and I'll get into more of that in just a moment. But um, once we did understand it, we were at pains to build microscopic features on the surface of the toes that uh, only stick when you bend them over, which is just what that video was showing, when you only bend them over in a certain direction and then you get a large area of contact. And then finally, given that you do have directional adhesion, that has implications for how you control and um, distribute the forces among the legs. And I'm not gonna say so much about that, but that turned out also to be quite important. So about this directional adhesion, so here are data from an actual gecko from uh, Keller Autumn again. And you can see that when we're dragging from um, essentially the palm of a gecko's foot out toward the tips of the toes, we get quite a bit of adhesion. But when you drag them in the opposite direction, essentially against the curvature of the sedal shafts, this is the way, this is not the direction in which the adhesive structures are intended to be loaded, we have no adhesion. So that's what we tried to emulate with our wedges. And here, for example, is a tape, uh, two pieces, uh, and we're lifting up a large uh, cylindrical object. And you can see that at the micro scale, there's a scale bar, 200 micrometers per scale. At the micro scale, we've got these uh, sharp wedge-shaped features that bend over, and that's what, what produces adhesion when you load it in shear. So it starts out with just the tips of the wedges making contact. And because in that case, let's see, it'll, it'll come round again in just a minute. Um, right now, the area is very small, so there's no adhesion. And then as we apply increasing shear loads, we get a much larger area of contact. And that's what produces the adhesion. And finally, you can actually continue to load it and it will start to slip while also still adhering which is interesting. And the gecko will do that too, by the way. All right, so let's look at the data. Here are data for a gecko. And on the vertical axis, I have force in and out from the plane of the wall. And on the horizontal axis, I have tangential forces. And so if, I'm, if I have positive normal force, that's a, that's a positive pressure I'm pushing against the wall. If I have negative normal force, that means I'm pulling away from the wall, I'm ad adhering to it. And in the tangential direction, if I'm um, in the upper part of this diagram, I'm uh, basically pulling upwards along the wall. And if I'm pulling downwards, I'm, I'm, I'm in the lower right corner. It's, it's down in this lower right corner that I want to be when I'm taking a step because I'm loading the adhesive to get, you know, propel myself up the wall and also obtaining some adhesion. So, if we look at this from kind of a standard you know, physics standpoint, what we see is that when I'm pressed against the wall and when I'm pushing upwards, what I have actually doesn't look very different from standard Coulomb friction, where the tangential force is less than or equal to mu times the normal phase force that looks like one half of a standard friction cone. The interesting part is the green part down here, where we see that my now negative normal force is growing in proportion to the tangential force that I apply up until finally it fails. And so that means that if you have a force vector of normal and tangential components, basically any force that is in this light blue safe region will be safe. And as soon as you go outside this region, either down below or off to the right, you'll either slip 
or, or it'll pop off the wall. So you wanna operate, if you're trying to take a step, you wanna operate in this blue region. And in particular, if you need to have some adhesion, you're gonna be in this kind of narrower triangle uh, down below the horizontal axis. So suppose that you are a gecko or a small robot and you're on the wall. And what that means is you're, you're trying to climb upwards. Your center of mass is close to the wall, but not quite at it. So it's a little bit away from the wall. Therefore, it's your front limb that has to apply the negative normal force, the adhesive force to hold you into the wall and uh, prevent you from tipping backwards. Your rear foot, meanwhile, is under compression. So when we look at that on our force base over here on the left, what we see is that your rear foot down here is in the compressive regime. And so it's at this blue dot. And your front foot, which is in the um, adhesive regime is, is down here with the green dot. And now you ask yourself, okay, well, which of these ones is nearest to the edge, the boundaries of this blue safe region? Well, obviously the green one is the one that's nearest to the edge. That's the one that we're worried about, that it will pop off. It has the small safety margin. So the tendency is to try to favor the front limbs. And when we started working on climbing robots, that was our intuition is that we would try to climb very cautiously sort of favoring the front limbs to prevent them from popping off the wall. And the point is that that's exactly the wrong thing to do. What instead you want to do is actually pull harder with your front limbs, taking more of your weight with your front limbs. And if you do so, the green dot will move from where it was over to here on the right at the center of this other dotted circle. Meanwhile, because you're now bearing more of your weight with the front limb, you'll bear less of it with the rear limbs. So the blue dot moves over there. And when the two circles have the same diameter, that's the optimal solution. So this leads to an interesting hypothesis for the uh, biology side of the collaboration, which is do geckos do this? Do they actually carry most of their weight with their front limbs? Because the physics says that they should. And indeed they do, look at this. Here is some data from Bob and Keller. And uh, what we're looking at from left to right, okay, so we have the front, the forefoot on the left and the right. Remember the geckos are doing a diagonal stride. So they've got two legs on the wall at a time. Um, and we, and uh, so we have left forefoot, right forefoot, and then the hind feet, left hind foot, right hind foot on, on the right. And what do we see? Well, in the um, fore and aft direction, what we see is that indeed it's the forefeet, the left and right forefeet are taking a larger load. In other words, it is indeed you know, supporting most of its vertical weight with its front limbs. Not a large difference, but enough to be um, statistically significant. Meanwhile, the normal forces do exactly what we would expect them to. They're negative, meaning adhesive at the front feet, and they're positive, meaning compressive at the rear feet. And finally, in the lateral direction, that side to side, um, this may be less interesting, but what we see is it's a symmetric pattern. They're pulling in towards the center line of the robot, and uh, sorry, the center line of the gecko. And, um, and that's something that you'll see with geckos. They're always sort of pulling inwards uh, towards, uh, towards the center line uh, in order to maintain adhesion. So indeed, it, they do what you would expect. So, um, that's a nice little example of, of bio-inspiration and where there's something that goes back and forth between biology and engineering. But now I wanna turn a little bit towards trying to extend the, the picture. This is a, a busy slide, but the point that it makes is that on the left, you know, we look at, at the, the uh, characteristics of, of biological structures. First of all, um, we see this enormous complexity that I talked about. Things are anisotropic, they are heterogeneous, astounding natural complexity. We see, as I mentioned, multiple materials, hard and soft, viscous, for example, uh, within a single structure. We see a large range of feature sizes from tens of nanometers up to centimeters, maybe even meters, depending on the creature. A thing to remember is that biological structures grow cell by cell, differentiating as they go. So the price that you pay for complexity is much lower than in mechanical systems. On the other hand, 
despite that we see these very elegant structures like you know the shell of a lobster or a crab where you have multiple materials and it uh, you know and it traps cracks and it's very um, damage resistant despite all that nature has a rather limited repertoire of bulk materials you will not find stainless steel or sapphire or carbon fiber in biological structures because those things require a lot of energy to process they're they're just inherently um, the working of them is not compatible with something that that is alive it is growing cell by cell meanwhile we're trying to build bioinspired structures on the right what do we have we have our very tight process constraints and they vary depending on the on the feature size so if i want to make the little micro wedges i may have to go over to the nanofabrication center at my university, which is in another building, uh, and allow and, you know requires me to put things on wafers and use masks and do exposure and so on. Conversely, if I'm working at the centimeter scale, I can use 3D printers in my own lab. Uh, because we tend to work with bulk materials, we we deposit something and then we either use a, a lithographic process to to pattern it or we shape it. 3D complexity is is uh, costly. Each, each new um, change in feature lengths or feature sizes uh, requires me to go to a new process and adds to the cost and complexity. So these are just some things to keep in mind, uh, you know, as we try to go back and forth with bioinspiration. So uh, here's just a, you know, a montage of many different groups around the world have tried to make gecko-inspired adhesives. And many of them are lithographic, some of them involve uh, Oh, percolating fibers through uh, a cellular filter, uh, sorry, a ceramic filter. Uh, some of them involve uh, micro machining kinds of processes. They're all though, you know, you look at them and they're complicated, but they're still very simple compared to what's in the gecko. And they're um, in many cases, they're not directional, which means that actually in many cases, a lot of these would not even work for us to uh, use for something like sticky bot to climb. So when we started with StickyBot, we had the, what you saw in the video from public television was a two-layer hierarchy. We made first a mold that we used a precision CNC uh, and made angled stalks and then cast a polymer into the, that mold. And then the second layer, we used a lithographic process. So this is what I mean about going into another building on campus, learning a whole new set of equipment. Uh, we used a UV transparent quartz wafer with a uh, deposited mask. We would shine, we would expose it from below, and then we would use a contact mask and do a secondary exposure from above. And if you get the two underexposed exposures just right, uh, and the alignment just right, you get these, sh and you do, uh, then you get these sharp, deep grooves into which you can cast material. And that's how you create these wedges that you saw earlier in the video. Uh, the process works. It's still being used at jet propulsion labs, um, but it but it's a fairly tedious process. And then finally, you you bring the two together to make that uh, two layer suspension that you saw in the video. So there's the larger stalks, which are uh, allowing us to conform at you know kind of the millimeter to a few millimeter scale. And then there's the little micro wedges on the upper surface. We actually do not at Stanford use this process anymore. We discovered that we could make microscopic features directly by machining molds in wax. And actually we've been able to extend this to machining molds in soft metal very recently. As our cutting tool, we use a microtome blade. This is what's used uh, in histology to take very thin slices of tissue to look at under a microscope. It turns out you can get diamond coated microtome blades. And if you're very careful with the trajectory so that you load this tool almost always in pure compression, uh, you can cut the surface of a mold to make wedges and you can use that for your adhesive. And what's kind of interesting about this is that we actually have more freedom over geometry. We're not, um, we're no longer stuck with the limitations of a lithographic process where there's a limited range of angles that we can do exposures at. I can, I can make wedges at different angles and I can even make curved shapes and so on. And this is interesting because it gives us different kinds of anisotropic properties. And I'm not gonna go into that in detail, but um, a fair bit of our recent work has been exploiting this extra freedom that we have. All right, so um, where does bioinspiration start to fall down? Well, 
we became interested in seeing if we could use gecko adhesion for human scale climbing. This is the work mainly of Elliot Hawks, who's now at UC Santa Barbara. And part of what was interesting is that a, a paper actually came out from Cambridge pointing out that uh, the approach taken by the gecko meant that if you wanted to use uh, Van der Waals forces to, to stick to walls, you were kind of limited to sizes on the order of a gecko. And the problem is this, uh, the, as you go to larger scales, of course, your area of your feet grows as L squared, but your mass, which is going as volume, grows as L cubed. So you would like your adhesive pressure also to increase as you get larger. Otherwise, you will need enormous feet. Unfortunately, everybody who has tried to do work with either synthetic adhesives or looked at geckos with natural adhesion, what you discover is that as you go to larger areas, the available pressure decreases significantly as area, area gets larger. So you wish it would increase, but actually it decreases. And it's captured nicely on this log log plot that Elliot put together. Um, here on the red line, what it's showing is that if you measure the adhesion available from individual seedal stalks, you get a certain amount of adhesive stress. This is in shear now. That's the part that's pulling you up a wall. And on the horizontal axis, I have the area on a log scale. And if I go to um, uh, lamellar uh, patches, a slightly larger area, what I see is that already my available adhesive stress is quite a bit lower. I'm not getting as high a stress as I got for an individual seedal stalk. And if I go to a toe of a gecko, it's even a bit lower. And if I go to an entire foot of a gecko, it's lower still. Meanwhile, if I want to do human climbing, my goal is over here. It's this green dot. And you can see that indeed, if you continue to follow the trend from a gecko, we're not quite going to make it. And the problem is this, and this is a nice uh, image that uh, Bharat Bhushan and his students put together. We have this. Um, hierarchy of compliances. But the problem is, is that if you, and you can just imagine, if you take this structure down and you put it against the surface, what you will see is that some of these little springy elements are going to make contact before their neighbors. And then when you start to pull away, they're going to experience uh, an increase in stress before their neighbors. And what will happen is that they'll fail before their neighbors, before their neighbors. And unfortunately, what will happen is that as soon as you get any localized cracks, any localized failure, then the whole thing just propagates across the whole surface, kind of like an avalanche. So that's one of the main reasons why you get poor adhesive scaling performance. And sometimes I like to use this analogy from Gulliver's Travels. What you really want is for every single stock to be loaded on uh, equally uh, in comparison to its neighbors and all sharing the load perfectly. Uh, a wag in my office said that this is the uh, Marxian solution to adhesion. All right, well, there are different ways you can accomplish this kind of load sharing. You could have a uh, phase change material, you could use a hydraulic or mechanical differential, or you could use what we call degressive springs. The um, two ideas are shown here. Um, the idea of a differential is actually a very old one. It's part of what's called a whiffle tree if you have a bunch of draft angle animals. And one of them, it allows you to share the load amongst them. You have several oxen here, six oxen pulling a cart. And even if one of the oxen uh, you know, gets ahead of its neighbors, it doesn't change the load sharing. The degressive springs are springs that start out being linear and then plateau. And uh, that's actually what we used for climbing with Elliot. What you can see here is a bunch of these springs loaded due to unevenness of the surface. They all start loading up along different paths, but due to this plateauing feature, they all top out at essentially the same maximum load. And that's what allows us to ensure that none of them fails prematurely. So we put that to work and that's how we're climbing uh, on the wall. What we've got is a paddle about the size of a table tennis paddle with 24 little tiles of adhesive, each with its own softening spring. Uh, and again, because people don't have enormous upper body strength, unlike the gecko, 
uh, we, we push with our legs. So what we built is a set of stirrups. So you, you push with your leg and then we transfer the load up to paddles that you place with your hand. And the, the process is like climbing a ladder where you sort of uh, move the ladder along with you as, as you go up the wall. So that's an example of where uh, we actually depart from the bio. Now, now that we kind of think we really understand what's going on, we're actually departing from bio-inspired solutions uh, to develop our own mechanisms for load sharing. I'd like to end with some very new work. We've started to work with NASA. We think that gecko adhesives are a great solution for grasping objects in space. Uh, you're in a vacuum, so you can't use suction. A lot of the materials are not magnetic. Uh, and what you want to do is to go up very gently and grab onto a satellite or a piece of space debris, attach it, manipulate it, pull it in, whatever you want to do with it, and, and then let go without imparting extra momentum to it and sending it off in some other orbit that you can't control. So I have here a short video, and uh, it again describes, I think, what we're trying to do pretty well. The amount of space debris has been growing exponentially in the past several decades. Space debris can possibly crash into new satellites and cause catastrophe. One way to prevent this from happening is to grasp and recycle the debris before a tragedy happens, like in the movie Gravity. At Stanford JPL, I've learned from gecko lizards to make small adhesive grippers that adhere to smooth surfaces such as solar panels and fuel tanks with really little attachment and detachment effort. This is a nice solution for grappling and releasing free floating objects. We then efficiently scale the gripper up and added a special wrist design to enable the grasping and manipulation of large objects. Experiments have been conducted in the NASA GPL air variant floor, also known as the Robodome, where a 400 kilogram master robot with the gripper tried to grapple another 400 kilogram slave robot by grasping a solar panel. Either controlled by a human or autonomous thrusters, the master robot successfully grappled the slave robot with only a slight push of large adhesion. The wrist acts like a nonlinear cushion that absorbs energy during impact and stays stiff during manipulation. Misaligned grasping is also demonstrated here. For a full 3D floating test, we build an even larger gripper that can grasp both flat and curved surfaces with a larger safety factor. Experiments were conducted in the NASA Zero Gravity Airplane, also known as the Vomit Comet. In the flat gripper mode, the gripper grasped a cubic object much larger than itself with little pressing force. When detaching, the gripper does not affect the object's motion state. This is very different from conventional sticky materials. Similar functions have been achieved with the curved gripper. Little attachment force, strong grip, and clean detachment. Spherical surface grasping has also been conceptually proved with a beach ball. Although it does not require much adhesion, it does require a very tiny engagement force because it is easy to knock the ball away. Earlier this year, NASA said- Yeah, in fact, now we get to, so by the way, we're using the same kind of uh, tendon and degressive springs to distribute the load. Um, what the end of that video alluded to is that we were able to send up a gripper to the International Space Station. This happened in July 2019, and then due to various reasons, it sat in storage doing nothing. But this last March, it finally came up on the queue, and we were able to see some experiments with it. And uh, there we have uh, Dr. Kate Rubens. She's actually, as it happens, a Stanford alum. Uh, pulling uh, our gripper out to mount on Astrobe, and uh, we were able to do some experiments. Working on a project you know one day will be launched into space, be that far away from you, look up in the sky and say, hey, I built something that's floating up there. I think it's very, very exciting, but at times also nerve-wracking. I only have one shot. This is a project about 
trying to grasp and manipulate objects in space using gecko-inspired inducers. One of the interesting things about a gecko is that most of the time it's not sticky, but when it needs to grab a surface, it can. And so we've developed a gecko-inspired material. If you were to look at it under a microscope, you would see a forest of little tiny sharp wedges. And the whole point is that, like the actual gecko itself, most of the time it's not sticky. But when it's loaded in just the right way, it will grip. And then on demand, we can release. In space particularly, we think it's useful because in, in space, things are free-floating. So that means that even though the adhesive is not especially strong, I don't need a lot of it in order to latch onto a relatively large object and, and then move it where I want. We are designing a gripper that it will be mounted on a platform designed by NASA called the ASOBI. The ASOBI is a free-floating uh, robot that will be operating inside the International Space Station. In collaboration with NASA, we are going to test how our gripper can enable the ASOBI to perform autonomous grasping and manipulations of objects in space. We've set up a ground station in our lab. So this ground station has a lot of software that basically allows us to communicate and actually visualize live what's going on. So we had a couple live video feeds that allowed us to actually monitor what the astronauts were doing. We can't directly communicate with the astronauts, and instead we go through our NASA kind of partners. We're watching live video, and then we step through the procedures that we've been working on and develop with our partners and collaborators at NASA. First, we'll just be some basic pull tests putting the gripper on different kinds of uh, objects, panel surfaces inside, applying known forces and recording what force it takes to make it lose its grip. Is it the same force that we are measuring in the laboratory? If not, why not? Then the next set of experiments will be ones that involve the uh, Astrobe platform under computer control, autonomously coming in and gripping. How reliable is that process? What range of velocities can we tolerate? It went great. I exceeded my expectations. We were able to get really good force data from the manual testing. And then the Astrobe was actually able to do some panning and tilting while they attached to the surface. The astronauts are really invested in seeing your hardware work. When we first had a couple unsuccessful purging attempts, it was really exciting to see the astronauts just really on the fly offering you know, solutions or troubleshooting or offering to go pick up some other test surface that we can try to grab onto. For me, working on uh, space applications is the pinnacle of uh, my research. And uh, uh, not just for me, but also for the students, being able to perform an experiment in space, the rewards are extremely high. Eventually, there's interest in grabbing things outside of the International Space Station, and I think that's the really interesting opportunity in the long run, because almost nothing else will work. You're in a vacuum, so you can't use suction cups. Most of the material is not magnetic, so you can't use electromagnets. If you want to grab a really large solar panel or an antenna, gecko adhesives is one of very few technologies that will work. All right. So that, that ends, and I'll open up to questions, and I'll see if I can get myself over to the Discord channel. Uh, th thanks, Mark. That was a fantastic uh, talk, and uh, really impressive to see uh, what you're doing with the space station. Um, I think we've got uh, room for a, a, a question or two here. I see uh, Kanjiro has a question. Would you like to ask uh, are these questions where? Are they in Discord or chat? They're, they're here, they're, they're live in Zoom. And then we'll go to Discord uh, okay. for a written question. Kanjiro? Uh, hello, can you hear me? I do. Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Mark Katowski. Um, then my, uh, I'm Kenjiro Tadakuma, Tohoku University, and a really long time now. See. And uh, thank you very much for your very impressive talk. And uh, I just would like to ask about the fabrication process. So um, at present, you chose the uh, micro sculpting to make yes. the, uh, the mm. so uh, would you please show us the, the reason why you chose uh, that um, method uh, at present? Is there yeah, much we, we had previously, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a good mm -hmm. question. Uh, because when we started out, we were using, as I mentioned, this lithographic process. 
but it, it's a complicated lithographic process that involves an angled exposure from below and then a secondary straight down mm. exposure from above. Uh, it's slow. And it also limits the range of shapes. We, we were only able to make wedges with one vertical side and one angled side. The micro sculpting gives us more freedom to mm. uh, control the geometry mm. of the wedges for mm. more or less adhesion as a function of shear force. It's also mm. slow. I mean, it, it takes actually a few hours to mm. make these micro sculpting cuts all the way across a mold but a few hours is, that's still actually much faster than the lithographic mm. process, which takes a few days. Thank you very much. So it means the, uh, uh, is your much optimized shape by using that? Yeah, I wouldn't say method, optimized, or? but closer to optimal. Uh, mm. I mean, we've done numerical studies of what should be the optimal mm. wedge shape, and we can get closer with the micro machining. Uh. Okay, really nice, uh, uh, fascinating talk. Thank you very much, sir. Well, thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you. Um, I think because we're running a bit late uh, that we will uh, move the questions to Discord. And of course we have a discussion section later. So at this point, so I'd like to thank uh, the speakers